Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander viewers are advised that the following program contains images of people who have died. Hey, Amelia Mosley here, bringing you a very special episode of BTN. As you can see, I'm standing in front of a ship. But it's not just any ship. This is the replica of the Endeavour, which was sailed into Botany Bay 250 years ago by Captain James Cook. Today, we're going to be spending the whole episode looking at that journey, the events leading up to it, the effect it had on Australia's Indigenous people and how it shaped the country we live in today. I'm also going to hop on board and get a tour of the ship. But first, let's take a look at the famous journey made by the Endeavour, its captain and its crew 250 years ago. Let's begin this story on the 26th of August 1768, the day the HMB Endeavour set sail from England. At the helm was this man on his first voyage as captain of a ship. His name was James Cook. Unlike most captains of the Royal Navy, Cook came from a poor background, growing up on a farm in northern England. When he was 18, he got an apprenticeship on a ship and threw himself into the study of maths, navigation and astronomy, all skills he would need one day to become a captain. Eventually, he joined the Navy, where his knack for making incredibly accurate maps got the attention of many in power. You see, by the 1700s, Europeans had been mapping the globe for centuries, claiming land and resources as their own. Now, with better ships and technology than ever before, and a new desire for scientific knowledge, they were determined to conquer the world. So, when a special voyage was planned by the British government and Britain's most prestigious scientific institution, Cook's name came up. The second most important person on the endeavour was this young man, Joseph Banks. Unlike Cook, he grew up wealthy in London. He went to the best schools and inherited a great fortune. Banks's main love was botany, the study of flora, fauna and other living organisms in their natural environment. He paid for his own spot on the endeavour, along with a team of scientists and artists. He wanted the chance to travel to faraway lands and return with drawings, specimens and knowledge of species that people in England had never imagined. At 2pm we got on the sail and put to sea, having on board 94 persons near 18 months provisions and stores of all kinds. So where were they going? Well, the main aim of the voyage was to travel to Tahiti by the coast of South America. There they'd observe a rare astronomical event that only happened every 120 years, the transit of Venus. It's where the planet crosses between the Earth and the Sun, and scientists figured that by studying it from different points on Earth, they could learn more about the size of our solar system. But then there was another task, a secret task. Before sailing from England, Cook had been handed confidential instructions by the Admiralty to open when he left Tahiti. There is reason to imagine that a continent or land of great extent may be found to the southward. You are to proceed to the southward in order to make discovery of the continent. You see, for centuries, Europeans believed there was a big mass of land in the south to balance out the big mass of land they knew existed in the north. They called it Terra Australis Incognita, or Unknown Southern Land. And now it was Cook's mission to find it. With the help of a Tahitian priest and navigator named Tapaya, the endeavour made its way to New Zealand, or Aotearoa. 
Cook's first encounter with Maoris didn't go well, and the crew shot and killed a number of people. But Tapaya helped to bring peace. Cook and Banks spent six months mapping the coasts of both islands, proving they weren't part of Terra Australis Incognita. They continued on, and in April 1770, they spotted land again. This time, it was the east coast of New Holland, as Australia was known to Europeans at the time. Though Indigenous people had been here for thousands of years, Europeans had never set foot on this side of the island before. And like in New Zealand, the first encounters were often violent ones. For the next couple of months, the Endeavour and crew sailed up to the tip of Queensland, mapping the coast and claiming the land for the King of England. At one point, the ship was nearly lost when it ran aground on the Great Barrier Reef, but the crew spent weeks repairing it. In 1771, the Endeavour finally arrived home again. It had been a long and difficult three-year voyage that had seen more than 30 men die, many from illness, including two scientists, an artist and Tapaya. Back in England, Banks quickly became famous with the first documented collection of Australian plant life. He also became a driving force behind the European colonisation of New South Wales in 1788. Captain Cook went on a second voyage in pursuit of that unknown southern land and ended up in Antarctica. His third voyage took him to Canada, Alaska, and finally Hawaii, where he was killed in 1779. All of the voyages had a lasting impact on the world, reshaping maps and changing the course of history. But it was that first voyage, the voyage of the Endeavour, that would be Captain Cook's enduring legacy. What was James Cook's first job? Was he a newspaper delivery boy, a cabin boy, or did he work in a grocery shop? He worked in a grocery shop in a fishing village where he met a lot of sailors and dreamed of going to sea. What part of the endeavour was left behind on the Great Barrier Reef? Its lifeboats, its cannons, or one of its masts? It's cannons. To stop the ship from sinking, the crew had to lose some weight, so they tossed some heavy stuff overboard, including a bunch of cannons. They were discovered on the ocean floor in 1969. What astronomical event was the crew of the Endeavour sent to observe? A solar eclipse, a transit of Mercury, or a transit of Venus? It was the transit of Venus. Which member of the Endeavour's crew used to be on Australia's $5 note? It was Joseph Banks. Speaking of Banks, can you name this Australian plant? Yep, it's a Banksia and it was named after the famous botanist. Well, now that we know a bit more about the Endeavour, let's jump on board the replica and have a look around. I'm here with Judith, who's going to take me on a tour. Can't wait. Let's do it. Let's go, Amelia. So, here we are. So, this is the amazing Endeavour replica. Pretty much how it was in the 1800s. So, we are actually feeling like the sailors would have felt. Up on the front of the ship, the bow, I like to give a clue. Oh. They had the 12 Marines on board and then the rest were scientific 
um, people and of course the people to run the ship. So for example the cook, uh, the carpenter, very important, the sail maker, as well as just ordinary sailors who kept the ship going. There were only men on board and just as well when you see the bathrooms. Okay, seats of ease. One on each side, depending on which way the wind's blowing. So that just drops right down into the... Into the ocean into if you're lucky. Ocean. Yeah, as long as the wind doesn't blow it back on you. <laughs> This is the mess area where most of the sailors would sleep, eat, generally relax. Judith, what were people eating? Well, usually porridge in the morning. For lunch, really whatever they had. So if they caught a seabird, if they caught some fish. One important thing that they had a serve of every day was sauerkraut, pickled cabbage. And that was really um, cooks idea to try and prevent the sailors getting scurvy, which was a pretty nasty disease if you didn't have enough vitamin C. So here we are in the Great Cavern. So this is where Cook would be drawing his charts, the mapping really as he was going, um, quite amazing cartographer. And Banks and Solander and their team would be going through all of the specimens that they had collected and they would be trying to match with any um, species that they already knew of from the Northern Hemisphere. Is there any way to know what Captain Cook was like? We don't have any recordings, of course, but we do have journals, and Banks kept a journal, Cook himself kept a journal, um, different crew people from time to time. How do we know that this is what the Endeavour looked like? We can thank the British Naval people for that really because they kept records and they kept plans of everything. So it gives you a really good idea, don't you think? It's, it's it pretty does. authentic. Yeah. It does, it it's really does. I, I can't say it's, it would have been a pleasant journey. You're not running away to sea anytime soon, no. no. <laughs> As well as the 94 human passengers, the Endeavour had some animals on board. What were they? Chickens, pigs or dogs? Trick question, there were pigs, chickens and two greyhounds on the journey. Plus a goat which had already sailed the world at least once. No kidding. What sort of vessel was the Endeavour? A galleon, a schooner or a bark? The Endeavour was a bark and she was originally built for hauling coal. The Endeavour we're exploring now is a replica. What do you think happened to the original? Is it in a London museum? Was it pulled apart for scrap wood or was it sunk? It's thought to have been deliberately sunk in 1778 during the American War of Independence. By then, it had been renamed the Lord Sandwich, and while it's not confirmed, archaeologists think they may have found the wreck off the coast of Newport in the US. Of course, for Australia's First Nations, Cook's first encounter was the start of a catastrophic period in history. And for many, this year isn't cause for celebration, it's a time of mourning. Let's find out more. On the other side of this bay is the exact spot Captain James Cook landed. It's hard to imagine what it would have been like 250 years ago, watching as the Endeavour sailed into what we know today as Botany Bay. But over the years, we've uncovered and learnt more about that first encounter between Australia's Indigenous people and Captain Cook and his crew. A lot of what we know comes from Cook's journals. We saw several people ashore, four of whom were carrying a small boat or canoe, which we imagined they were going to put in the water in order to come up to us, but in this we were mistaken. But there are also stories that have been passed down by the first Australians who saw the Endeavour arrive. Hey Jack, how are you going? Welcome to the Maritime Museum. Bo from the National Maritime Museum has put together an exhibition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artworks to tell the story of Cook's arrival as seen from the shore. So Bo, what do we know about that first encounter? 
Well, I think these days we know a lot more. I mean, when I was at school, we were taught that Captain Cook, the first encounter was at Keme, the local people there at Botany Bay. Um, Cook came ashore and everything went quite well. But um, now looking back at it, we know that there, from that very first time that Cook tried to come ashore, there was conflict. The people Cook and his crew saw were Gwigal, a clan of the Dharawal people. Do we have any idea of what uh, the Gwigal people thought Captain Cook and his crew were? I think the, a lot of the local people um, nowadays are saying that they thought that Cook was a spirit, um, being white, fair-skinned, you know, that there's a spirit coming back and not to go near the spirit. The local people didn't want them to come ashore. They were shouting at them, um, threw rocks at them, trying to let, make them go away. But Cook and his men didn't go away. And when they were confronted by two Gweagle men, they shot at them, hitting one man in the leg. Cook and his men then entered the Gweagle camp and took shields and spears, leaving in return beads, cloth and nails. In his journal, Cook wrote of his admiration for the indigenous people's way of life. From what I have said of the natives of New Holland, they may appear to some to be the most wretched people upon earth, but in reality they are far more happier than we Europeans. He also acknowledged that all they seemed to want was for us to be gone. But that didn't stop him claiming the entire East Coast for the British Crown. The land was said to be terra nullius, meaning land belonging to no one. Of course, that wasn't the case. And why have you chosen to include this piece in the exhibition? Really important because, as I said, it talks about that deep time and that deep connection, you know, um, that we have been here forever, that the, we have been practising these traditions and cultures forever. But we're also evolving culture and we're still here. Do you think Cook was aware of that? Sometimes I like to be on Cook's side and say that he did think about that, but, you know, I, do, I don't think that was his mission either. You know, his mission was to come and find this great southern land and if he was able to claim it, for the crown. So Bo, can you tell me about this artwork? And this is done by Paddy Fordham, who's actually from Arnhem Land. What Paddy's trying to explain is it wasn't the first Captain Cook for them, it was all the Captain Cooks that came afterwards. To many, Captain Cook has become a symbol of all the European colonists who came after him, who took the land from indigenous people, brought diseases and tried to erase cultures. While they didn't succeed, the devastating impact of colonisation is still being felt. So I recognise this guy, Cook. Um, there's two of him. What's, what's this all about? So this is um, a contemporary work by artist Jason Wing, and he's actually called them Captain Crook. And this is Captain Crook unmasked, and this is Captain Crook masked. It's quite a powerful image. What, what are you expecting audiences' their reaction to be? I hope it makes them think a little. You know, I hope they do think about um, the history we have been taught to, the history we know now, and the history that hopefully is being spoken about in this 250th year, you know, that we've moved as a country to go, well, yeah, actually, how can you dis discover a place that's already inhabited? How can you claim a space that already has people living here? Um, and that's really what Jason's just wanting people to think about, you know? We're, we're not fixed to this one way of seeing or one way of viewing a certain point in time, you know. There is always a dual perspective and um, our voices need to be heard and our stories need to be told. What was the original name of Cook's landing place at Botany Bay? Is it Kamei, Gaimia or Bandina? It was Gamay, and it was home to the Gwigal, Gamaygal and Bidjigal families, clans of the Darawal people. This bark shield belonged to a Gwigal warrior who was shot by Cook's party. It's now held in which museum? The Australian Museum or the British Museum? It's held in the British Museum. The descendant of its owner has been trying for years to have it brought back home. The legal principle terra nullius was used to justify colonisation of Australia. It's a Latin term. What does it mean? Everyone's land or nobody's land? It means nobody's land, but that wasn't true. Eventually, in 1992, the Australian High Court officially overturned terra nullius and recognised Indigenous land rights. 
What's the name of this famous Torres Strait Islander who led that court case? It's Eddie Marbo. For some people, Cook's arrival is a chance to look at how Australia's changed over the past 250 years. Let's find out more about our country's journey from a penal colony to the home we know today. On the 26th of January 1788, the first fleet arrived in Sydney Cove. Captain Arthur Philip raised a flag, declaring possession of the land for the British Crown. Among the new arrivals were more than 700 convicts, the first of around 160,000, who would eventually be sent to build penal colonies and endure harsh conditions to win a ticket home or a new life in a new land. Of course, the land they were building on belonged to the hundreds of Aboriginal groups that had been living there for tens of thousands of years. And there were many conflicts as competition for land grew between Indigenous and non-Indigenous. Thousands of Indigenous people were killed by the colonisers, while diseases like smallpox and measles spread and killed thousands more. Over the next few decades, more and more people arrived in the six new colonies. Some were convicts, others were free settlers. People who had decided to leave their life in Britain and make a new one in Australia. Then in 1851, Australia struck gold, literally. Hundreds of thousands of people came to Australia from all over the world to try their luck in the newly discovered gold fields. Fast forward to 1901 and Australia was proclaimed a federation and the six colonies became one nation. Oh, the uh, NT and ACT came along a few years later. But not everyone was welcome in this new nation. And the very year of federation, the White Australia policy was established, which made it harder for people who weren't from Europe to immigrate to Australia. Today, migrant ships are bringing new settlers to Australia. New lifeblood for our young country. After the First and Second World Wars, hundreds of thousands of people immigrated from European countries, helping to build the economy and change the face of the young nation. Eventually, the White Australia policy was scrapped, and over the years, people have continued to come here from all over the world, bringing with them their different foods, beliefs and traditions. Meanwhile, Australia's first people faced a long and difficult road to equality. They continued to be treated like outsiders in their own country, removed from their land, forced to work in harsh conditions with little to no pay, while thousands of children were taken away from their families and their homes and placed in missions or foster care. But Indigenous people fought hard for their rights and there were some big wins. In 1970, Australia marked the bicentenary of Cook's arrival in Australia with massive celebrations. There was a visit from the Queen and a reenactment of the first encounter. Now, 50 years later, Australia is a different place and many don't see the anniversary as a cause for celebration. Some have questioned whether we should spend so much time and money celebrating an event that brought misery to a lot of people. But others say it's important to mark such a big moment in the country's history and that while we can't change the past, it's a chance for us to come together and look back at how far we've come in 250 years and celebrate what makes Australia, well, Australia. We'll be back next week with a regular episode of BTN, but in the meantime, you can always stay up to date with BTN Newsbreak every single weekday. There's also heaps to see and do on our website. Have an awesome week and I'll catch you soon. Bye.